Yo, Adam Saxon here with Guy in the Cube, and today I am joined with Christian Wade from the Power BI product team. We are talking about ags. Let's do it. Christian, thank you for joining me. We are on the show floor of Microsoft Ignite. Yes, we are. All right, and I hear you're gonna you're gonna demystify. So, first off. Hopefully you have seen the clicky clicky draggy droppy demos that Christian has done before. It is an awesome demo, it's amazing with massive data. And so what we want to do is show you the clicks to get to the clicky clicky draggy droppy. So we're going to That's demystify we the magic exactly. of the ads It's about feature. time that it's all revealed. People need to know. People need to know, so let's all reveal right. it. All right, so Christian, what do we got? Walk us through okay, this. Okay, so this is the biggest scalability feature in the history of scalability. I mean, in the history of everything. This, this is. is like massive. This is this like is. clicky, clicky, draggy, droppy over petabyte scale yes. data sets. This is absolutely insane. It's yes. on another planet. All right, now, um, as you know, as you said, you know, we've done the clicky, clicky, draggy, droppy demo so many times. Everyone wants to know, how on earth do I set this thing up? It okay? can't be real. This it's, it's, can't it's, be real. Right. No, so I'm about to show you right now that it really is real. It's not a figment of my imagination. This is really in the September desktop release. It's on uh, public preview right now. It's going to be hosted in the service very soon, and it will then GA very soon after once it works with RLS. All right, so let's get stuck in. So the concept is, Adam, as you, as you are well aware, we achieve blazing fast performance in Power BI by caching data into memory. We compress the data and cache it into memory. Because it's faster there. That's, it's faster right. there, it's easily accessible, that's what enables the clicky clicky draggy droppy interactive analysis. Um, but with really big data sets, you don't actually need a, a petabyte scale data set. Believe it or not, I happen to have lots of petabyte, I don't have lots of petabyte <laughs> scale He's data He's got set. one in his back yeah, pocket right I, now. I, you know, I pick, I, I'm on my way into work and I see a petabyte here and a petabyte there and I don't even bother picking them up. <laughs> we, we you know, actually, got so many of them now. We were actually but, talking, walking over here, we're like, look, we, even, we haven't even checked Twitter yet, we might be up to a zettabyte. Yeah, we might be up to a zettabyte right. already. By all, you know, that's how fast this feature grows and, and that's the, the scale that we're dealing with it. So um, you don't actually need a, a petabyte of data. You don't actually need a trillion rows. Any data set that is expensive to cache because it, of its size, whether it be time, money, memory, management overhead to duplicate the data into the in-memory cache, pretty much any of those data sets could benefit from this feature. All right. So with Power BI, we cache the data into memory. So what we're doing with this feature is we're caching the data at the aggregated level, which uses a tiny fraction of the memory requirements and unlocks these massive data sets and is going to transform interactive analysis over big data, right? So how Sounds do we great. define the aggregation? Let's reveal how we Here actually we define I'm the aggregation. This Here we is, go, I'm ready. This is the meat and potatoes, ready. Adam. Here we go. All right, so we define the aggregation simply as another table <gasps> in the Power BI data set. What? That's it. It's as simple. No, as, it's, yeah, there's it's, more than that. No, it's, if, if you think about aggregations in multidimensional with all of these lattices and intersections, and no, it's just a table. It's so simple. All right, right? All so right. I t let me tell you what that means, right? The, the fact that it's just a table, number one, it can be an import or direct query table. Even the aggregation table can be direct query. So you can oh, have an, a direct query aggregation over a direct query detail table. Why would you want to do that? Well, you could be, number one, you could be managing and refreshing that aggregation uh, in your data warehouse. You could be using incremental data load processes to refresh that aggregation. You could optimize it with column store, right? And without even having a single import table, you suddenly make direct query over large data sets usable, right? So, love it. Love it. Um, you know, you have the flexibility to work with externally defined aggregations. That's one reason why it's just another table. Another reason it's just another table is that you can manage, uh, for example, incremental refresh on it. If you have a big aggregation that's going to cover a, a, a big chunk of, of the user requirements, you could actually set up incremental refresh on it. So here I have this aggregation table, and uh, currently everything is direct query. You can see this is built on the composite models feature that allows me to set the storage mode for each table, which is a game changer in terms of not being constrained to just direct query or import. Um, now, this is the cells aggregation table, and it's an aggregation of the cells ag table, which is an aggregation of the cells table. Let's pretend that sales has 10 billion rows and is expensive to catch, right? So I've created this aggregation table. Again, it's just a table. 
It should be hidden. It very much has to be hidden. Uh, once it works with row-level security, it won't even be addressable if you're not an admin on the data set. So if you're not running in desktop, for example. So you've got to be the owner of the so data set. So you've got to be the owner of the, of the data set. So always have the aggregation table hidden. And um, in this case, I could be performing my aggregation in the SQL Data Warehouse, and I could have it, when, once I set it to import, I'd be able to set up incremental refresh so, on it. So real quick, to build that aggregation table, we just yep. do the normal get data, pull it in. The normal get data. Okay. The normal get data and set up the relationships just like usual. And then we can like add measures and stuff to that as well? Uh, typically, the measures wouldn't be on the actual ag table because okay. um, the users, the, the, the aggregation table is kind of abstracted from okay. the users. It's not part of the logical model that the users see, the business oriented model. So they wouldn't actually see the ag table, but you can definitely have uh, measures that refer to the detail table that are then going to leverage the aggregation table. In and the then, back, in terms of end. building out the ags table, uh, would we do some, because we can do like Power Query to pull that in, yeah. could I do a calculated column? on it as well? Yes. If we're you, doing imported? Yes, you can. Okay. Yes, you can. All right, good yeah. to know. So uh, here it's telling me that I can't set up incremental refresh because it's not import. That makes a lot of sense. You, it has to be import to, be, uh, uh, to set up incremental refresh. But just to reiterate, you can set up incremental refresh so that if it's a big aggregation table, you don't need to reload all the data every time you do a refresh, which is much, much more efficient, which is another memory uh, uh, usage efficient, efficiency feature for large models. We've got this table. Uh, I, I could be performing the aggregation in the M expression or in the source, and I now want to set up the aggregation mappings, right? I want to s provide the metadata that tells the engine, the United Services engine it, that Power BI runs on, that queries that refer to the sales table will get redirected to the sales ag table and be super fast. Got Makes it. Sense? Got it. Does, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, cool. Now, the, and so, actually, so it's so it's a it's a redirection. It's a redirection. And if you think about it, this table it's really just the sum of sales grouped by customer ID, date ID, and product subcategory ID. That's the non-empty cross join of those keys, which could be tiny. This could be a ten billion row sales table, and this thing could just have a, a couple of million in, right, for example. Right. 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 So it'd be it's much much smaller because it's the yeah. aggregate, right? Okay. So time to reveal how I actually set up the mapping. So you ready? This, you this, ready for this? This, trick, this tripped me up one this time. Is, this is the, the, right. the, real, the real deal right here. So let's go ahead and lo and behold, the manage aggregations context menu. And so, now. Uh, real quick, which table are we doing that on? So we're doing it on the ag table itself. So this is what tripped me up because okay. My thought on it would be, oh, well, I'm doing a redirect, so I want to do it on the main table yeah, to redirect yeah, to the yeah, ags. Yeah, yeah. We, but it's really the reverse we of that. We had many design discussions. That's, that's with a user question. Experience. That, yeah. We had many different designs, and we went back and forth, and in the end, we <laughs> anchored it on the actual aggregation table. But we did consider other designs okay. as well. Okay. And once you're here, of course, you can switch to other tables uh, using this drop down. And so, as you can see, it's listing all of the columns in the aggregation table, right? Some of them are foreign key columns. So for now, I'm not going to bother setting the foreign key columns. Like you could set them uh, uh, for verbosity and clarity. Maybe we'll come back to the foreign key columns uh, shortly. I'm just going to go straight to the actual aggregated values, right? So I've got sales amount sum. So that is, uh, believe it or not, a sum of sales, sales amount. And that's it. I've just set up that aggregation map. That's it. That is it. Oh. It's as simple as that. There's no aggregation lattices and like node graphs and some black art <laughs> to try and figure out whether you're getting ag hits and stuff. It's simply wow. sum of sales amount. All right. There we go. Got it. All right. So let's do the same for unit price. It's easy peasy. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. That's, that's how we roll. All right. So <laughs> All right. So sum of sales unit price. And where is it? There it is. And now I'm going to do another aggregation on the same detail column, but this one's account. Got it. Right? Got okay. it. Okay. So I'll I'll show you why this is relevant shortly. So now, the so these will only take effect like if I do a count operation from like a DAX perspective, right? Yes. So the DAX aggregation functions will leverage these aggregation mappings, and as I'm about to show you, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship between the DAX 
aggregation function and these mappings, okay. right? Okay. So you actually get more bang for your buck in terms of coverage I on like the that. next aggregation I function. I like that. That's, that what, sounds that's good. what we're all about, right? Bang for the buck. That's right? it. Uh, fact internet cells count. This one's a special one because it's the count of the rows in the table. This is what the count rows DAX function uses. Ah, so that, right? that was one thing I was worried, like what's the difference between count and, and count, count table rows? Right, right. And this one is almost like a best practice to ha always have one of these because sometimes Power BI will generate count rows DAX queries without you even explicitly asking so, for them. So that's how when we did the uh, the one trillion row demo, yeah. we did a count rows. Yeah to show the one exactly. trillion. Exactly, the count rows, that was an explicitly defined count rows and it was using exactly a mapping like this. Got it. Now sometimes even in the filter area, it will show you the member count of all the, the, the filter members and it will generate a count rows query just to populate the filter pane. Yeah. And so uh, it's a good idea to have a count rows okay. in there. All right, good, cool. good to know. All right, so we'll go ahead and say this is just a count rows of sales and we are done. We are actually done. That it's quick. as easy as that, right? It's quick. Okay. So we're done there. All right, so we've set up the aggregations. What I'd like to do now is switch the aggregation table to use the import storage mode. Instead of, because right now it's direct query. Yeah, right now everything is direct query. Okay. So as you can see here. Yep, so you mentioned before that we can use direct query or import. So what's the reason why we need to switch this over to import? If we want that blazing fast <clears throat> performance and we've created this aggregation table, it's a lot smaller so we can fit it into memory. Um, then we want to use the composite models feature to set the aggregation table to be import and we can leave the 10 billion row detail table or the 10 billion row fact table, we can leave that as direct query. Right. And, the, and the reason for that is because direct query, we still have some overhead and there's, there's not, I mean, performance is not going to be nearly as good as import. Right. And Nothing so the main is, design purpose of this is really import is the shining star. Yeah. If you can do it, do import. Absolutely. For so, the AGS table specifically. Yeah, the Vertipak in memory, <laughs> Uh, cash is the fastest uh, you can get. I mean, Got it's it. the fastest on the planet that I'm aware of. Awesome, anyway. awesome. All right, so let's go ahead and say this table is currently direct query. Let's set it to import. Now, I'd just like to take a moment to explain this dialogue because uh, what it's saying <laughs> here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skim over the first couple of paragraphs. So it's saying that it wants to set these related dimension tables to be dual. So what on earth is dual? Let's, let's answer that. So composite models actually introduced three storage modes. We have import, we have direct query, and we have dual. Dual means that the table can flip back and forth between import and direct query. Why is that useful, you might Ooh. ask. Yeah. Why is that useful? So th that is useful because <laughs> if you think about it, if I submit a query that asks for sum of cells, and it is at the granularity that can hit the ag, then it would get redirected to the cells ag table and let's say we're grouping by uh, year and then the, the date dimension table would act as an import table for that group by operation. Got it. So far so good. Yep. So everything would just come back from in memory and it'd be super fast. Okay. But if I submit a query that cannot hit the in memory cache, right, and it still needs to group by date year, then date is going to flip to Got direct it. query on the fly. Got it. Right? That makes this sense. It's much more efficient to push that some group by operation down yes. to the source system. So we let the engine determine what the best route is. Exactly. Because if, 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 if date was purely import and then it needed to get data from sales in direct query, it would have to do a join on the Power BI side, right. which would be super, super expensive. expensive. It could yep. potentially get all 10 billion rows and have to do the join on Power BI side. That's the key way to conceptualize this. Whereas dual allows to push it down. Now in reality, it would optimize a little bit more than pulling all 10 billion rows. It would generate the in clause where filter right. from Power Query that is uh, 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 subject to the privacy levels and all that. But it's never going to be as fast as just pushing the yeah, sum group absolutely. by operation down to the source. Let the That's data source do the work. Gives you, right? yeah. That's what Joule gives you. So it's saying it wants to set these tables to Joule and it's figured out what are the minimum dimension tables that it needs to set to Joule, which is super useful. If you have a hundred table dimensional model coming from a data warehouse and you just want to cache a couple of tables, you can let desktop figure out what are the minimum dimension tables you need to nice. set to dual, right? So it's another feature to help with these complex so, models. So you wouldn't recommend, we don't need to set everything to dual. No, no, it's only the tables only what's needed. that are on the one side of one-to-many relationships, either directly or indirectly. Got it. So for example, I'm going to go ahead and set these to, and I can also set the storage mode by multi-selecting tables and setting them in one shot. Because this is the new designer. This is the new. It's not out yet. The, the new uh, uh, modeling view. It's coming soon. That's coming soon. So I'm going to go ahead and set two of the five tables to dual this way. 
Now, right. uh, because this new design is not out yet, mm -hmm. This is doable in the old designer. Yeah, you have to do it from the report view. You can get to the properties pane from okay. the report right. view currently. Yeah. Got it. OK, so having done that, I'm going to come back in and set sales ag to import again. As you can see, instead of listing the five tables, it's figured out that these are the only three that it needs to set to dual. Right, because the other ones are, are yeah. already dual. Yeah, and in the current build of desktop, um, it is mandatory that these are uh, uh, set to dual. In the only way you would be able to have these relationships in the current build of desktop is using many-to-many -many relationships. In a not-too-distant future release of desktop, it will be allowed, but it will be highly advisable to set them to dual instead of having them as import because of the, the reasons we described earlier. To Got avoid it. doing the join on the Power BI side. That's okay. the key thing to, to remember. All right. So we'll go ahead and uh, say OK to this. It's going to, this is the, the security right. risk in relation to the privacy levels because of uh, query folding when it uh, pushes the in clause where filter down to the source. Go ahead and let this refresh. Okay, and we're done. And we're ready to now actually start querying. Okay. It. All right. Now so, we're ready. Now we're ready. So I'm going to use a phenomenal DAX querying tool called DAX Studio, which you may be aware of. Yep, go get that over at SQLBI.com right. for free. Absolutely. So then here we have. Uh, a, a query that just asks for the sum of sales amount grouped by calendar year. Naturally, this should hit the, the in-memory cache. Let's find out. So naturally, this should hit the in-memory cache. So if we look here at the server timings tab, we got a scan, Ooh. right? So uh, the, the scan means that it got data from uh, the in-memory Vertipak store. So this alone, and it's got an XM SQL query, this alone tells me that we hit the cache because okay. The sales ag table is in import and the sales table is in DQ. So this alone is already telling me that we hit the cache. Additionally, Dex Studio is, has been kind enough to subscribe to <laughs> <laughs> the aggregate rewrite attempt extended event, which is also available in SQL Profiler. And then here, we've got this nice little check mark saying match found, and we can expand the details here and get the exact slice of the subquery that was submitted and further nice. mapping info, right? Yes. That's super nice, so super th useful. This build of, uh, this is a preview build of DAX Studio. Yes. Uh, as of the recording of this video, it is not publicly available yet, but it is coming soon. Yeah. Uh, what, does it have a build version on it, 2.8? So it's going to be in the two point, the current version as of the recording of this video, it's 2.7.4. And this one is going to be in the 2.8 range. So stay tuned on that. Yeah. If you're not using 2.8 or better, you're not going to see this yeah. feature. This is super, super useful for aggregations. And with the XMLA endpoint that's coming soon, you'll be able to use DAX Studio against the Power BI service and check whether your ags are getting hit in the service as well. Ooh. Yeah, that'd be yeah, insane. Yeah, yeah. Right? XMLA is super I mean, powerful. Yeah. So XMLA yeah. is, we'd let's yeah. do another recording. Yeah, 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 we'll, yeah, we'll, right. we'll, we'll okay. do that. <laughs> All right, so uh, here we have another query, which again is just asking for some of sales amount. There's no, the, the, the query isn't even aware that this sales ag table even exists. It's completely oblivious to the existence of aggregations. Love right? it. All it knows is that the, the queries are magically fast. It's, you know, uh, so then this one, we got the data here, and this was actually a, a direct query, right? So we can see instead of a scan, we got SQL. Here's the direct query that was sent to the source. And when we look at the rewrite event, it said attempt failed. Why did this not hit the cache? Because this is doing a, a sum of sales, but this time it's grouping by the product name, which back in the model, you can see product will not hit the cache, right? Because the cache will yep. relate to product subcategory, but product subcategory could have many products. It wouldn't know which product to aggregate to, right? Makes sense. Makes right? sense. So it just dynamically on the fly switched to direct query, and the, the date table was included in the direct query. So one minute it was included in the in-memory cache hit, yep. and the other minute it was included in the Love direct it. query because it's dual. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. All right, so, so far so good. So we've got the fundamentals going. I'm going to do another query here, which is just using the count rows DAX function. Uh, naturally, this will hit the ag as well because we set up that count table rows. Right. Right. Um, so we got an, a, a rewrite. Uh, right there. Run that again. We're doing this on the fly. Yeah, on the fly, and we got a, a, a hit. And now, let's get to some interesting ones. Like I said, there is more DAX aggregation function coverage than you might expect. Oh. L let's cover it. So average. But wait, there's more. There, wait, there's more. So average, do you think average is going to hit the cash? We didn't define average. We didn't define average. We defined how could sum you even have and we defined count. Exactly. How could you even define uh, an average when it's a non-additive 
uh, aggregation. Yeah. How, are you, how are you gonna be able to do this? All right, Well, I'm let's curious. find out, let's run this thing. Whoa, we actually got an ag hit on, on what's, the what's, what's going on? There. That's awesome. Right, that is awesome, right? So what it did, average of unit price. Let's take a look at the aggregation mappings dialog again. And if you remember, oh, unit it's price. Doing. So it's taking the average of the sums? It, so unit price has a sum and a count, right? It okay. has a sum and a count. So it can do the math. Internally, the average, the Night Services engine will internally, uh, um, for an average, will take the sum divided by the count. Right. So internally, it's generated two sub-queries. For each of those, it's figured out, can I hit the cash? And it said, yes, thank you very much. Oh, let's do that's it. That's a beautiful yeah, thing. That's a beautiful thing. That's, that's a, a beautiful, beautiful, thing. beautiful, beautiful thing. Now, now, let's not get carried away, right. right? Let's not get too carried away. How on earth let's stay I, realistic. Let's stay realistic. I mean, how on earth can distinct count hit the act? Surely not. Surely not. I mean, this, th well, this is no, because like, distinct count. It's actually got a. I mean, that's. I mean, how could I even aggregate distinct count? I mean, it would have to be at the the exact granularity. It wouldn't right. work above right. uh, 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 any other aggregations. So the first hit, okay, it's not hitting the cache. It submitted a uh, distinct query and the rewrite attempt failed. However, makes sense. Makes however, sense. that makes complete sense. However, we can actually make distinct count hit the act in this particular case. Believe it or not, here do it tell, comes. Do here tell. It comes. All right, so what we're doing here is we're taking a distinct count of customer key. Now, as I said earlier, uh, yeah, okay. okay. Right. So we left the foreign keys blank, right? Because we don't need them. It can rely on the relationships. It, the engine is smart enough to say, you know what? I've got relationships, I've got everything I need. Easy peasy, let's just hit the act, right? But if I wanted to, for verbosity and clarity's sake, I could actually set up the uh, group by mappings on all of the foreign keys. So let's go ahead and do that. Sales, uh, order date key, and customer key, sales. Yeah, what's the reason for the group by? Uh, order date key. Oh, oh sorry, customer key. Sorry, no tripped you up there. No worries. Uh, where is it? There it is. So. I'm going to show the, the group buys are actually mandatory in some scenarios. So distinct count happens to be one of them. Another one is the big data or the Hadoop based big data modeling scenario, which Got I can it. show you real quickly in just a second. Um, or you can fill them in just for clarity's sake. It depends on your preference. If you feel that this is more readable, if you fill in the foreign keys, you can do it. But as we just saw, it's not mandatory if you have a dimensional model. So what I mean by that is that a dimensional model is going to have relationships between the dimension tables and the fact tables, right? So it can rely on the relationships to figure out whether the ags can get used or not, right? So let's go ahead and say group by, and then this one's actually not in the sales table. We need to get to the product table to get to product subcategory key. Now, now we are saying to the engine, customer key, which happens to be what I'm doing a distinct count on, customer key is flagged as a group by attribute. I'm therefore telling the engine, I've got all the customer keys in the ag table, otherwise I wouldn't be able to group by it. Right? So it's smart enough to say, okay, well, I'll just use that for the distinct count. Right? Make sense? Yep. All right. Yep, absolutely. So let's go ahead and run this. Run this again. And lo and behold, we got a scan and a rewrite Ooh. with a match found. That is right? amazing. That is amazing. That is right? amazing. That is amazing. Now, a couple of quick things about distinct count. There is a threshold on somewhere between two and five million distinct values where there is a performance degradation. Uh, that still applies, but there are still many uh, uh, useful scenarios for distinct count. So this one here, where my detail table is direct query, it's gonna be much faster by hitting the in-memory cache to get the distinct count, that's number one. And number two, even if the detail table were cached in, in a subsequent release, currently the detail table has to be a direct query, but even if you have a 10 billion row cache table, distinct count can be slow there, but if you have only three million distinct customer key values and you put that in an ag table, you're gonna get a performance benefit that way as well, all right? But uh, in this simple case, it's super useful. It just means I don't need to run a direct query distinct count. Query. Yeah, that's great. Okay, all right, cool. Super speedy. Yeah, so that way alone is, is super useful. So that's distinct count. And then this one over here, we would expect this to work, right? Because we've already seen the uh, sum of sales and count rows hit the ag, and it did. The reason I'm showing you this is that this is uh, a somewhat more complex measure. You, you know, aggregations is not just for simple sum measures, right? You can have all these complex measures with sum divided by a count, multiplied by a ratio, by the percent of parent, or, or what. Ultimately, pretty much everything gets folded down to a sum, min, max, or count, 
right? And just like you saw with the average function, once it folds down to the sum, min, max, or count, it can create a logical query plan to detect for each of those uh, sub-queries whether it can hit the aggregation cache or not, right? Uh, that's the way to think about it is, uh, it, the physical query plan will likely not always stick to that rule, but if you think about it, it'll internally get folded down to a sum, min, max, or count. Even the average function does that, right? And then it will evaluate for each of those subqueries whether it can hit the cache, right? And then the physical query plan will deviate from that, but that's the starting point. Nice. All right. All right. Cool. So that's the dimensional Ooh. modeling. That's how you do it. All right. Right? Now, there's um, a couple of things I'd like to quickly reiterate because not a lot of people understand this dual mode thing. I just like Got to it. reiterate this dual mode. Okay. All right. So just think of it like this. Dual mode allows Power BI to not have to do the join on the Power BI side, which is way more efficient, right? So if I had a, uh, a, a couple of tables, cells and date, I have a one-to-many relationship between them. In the current build of desktop, you can't even set this up. It has to be a many-to-many. -many. In a not-too-distant future release of desktop, you will be able to set this up, but it will not be recommended for the reason that I described. It will have to do the join on the Power BI side, right? Not very efficient. Got it. So what we can do instead is just set the date table to dual, and then we do, when we do a sum of cells group by year, for example, it will push that sum group by operation down to the source. And if I have a query that just touches the date table or just touches another in-memory fact table group by a date attribute, it will all be returned from in-memory. Seems pretty simple, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, good, good, good. And these are the rules uh, uh, that you have to align with for, for dual. Basically, the table on the one side can always be dual, irrespective of what it is on the many side, which is why you tend to have these dimension tables Got it. be the, the, the dual table. All right. All right, so uh, the, the last piece of the jigsaw that I think we should cover, right, okay. is, is how to set it up for these Hadoop-based big data models, because okay. they can be a little bit different, all right. right? So, you, you know, for these, these uh, Hadoop-based, like, the, for these big data sources like uh, HDI, Spark, and Databricks, um, you, you know, with these big data sources, unlike a dimensional model, where we can rely on the relationships between the dimension tables and the fact tables, with these big data models, what tends to happen is that, yes, they can store petabytes of data, but they don't tend to deal with uh, joins between petabyte tables very well. No one's perfect, right? <laughs> so what tends to happen is you have these uh, fact tables with all of the, di the relevant dimension attributes denormalized into the fact table. In, re in reality, it's just stored as a file with all of, and this will be the file header, right? So here we have the driver activity table. This is actually the trillion row uh, uh, demo uh, uh, model, basically. And so this will have a, a trillion rows, quarter of a petabyte in uh, Spark. And uh, here we have an, the aggregation, in this case is direct query, but it would be import, right? And we can generate this aggregation data set in using Spark if we want. Now the key thing is, all we had to do here, we've gone from th this table for the trillion row demo has got 1.68 billion rows. Uh, and it actually compresses quite well. It compresses to under 20 gigabytes. And um, the, the, this table here is a trillion rows and it's a quarter of a petabyte. How on earth is that possible? Because we've removed the high cardinality columns, right? Mm. We've got longitude and latitude, right? It's good advice for anything. Yeah, it's good advice for anything. If you can. Absolutely. So we removed the high cardinality columns and that reduced the number of rows dramatically. My highest cardinality column here is date, which has 500 rows in. Everything else is pretty much categorical. You know, age might have, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, less than 100. Pretty much everything else is either a Boolean or a categorical attribute with like four or five values in. So when I do the non-empty cross-join across these attributes, it reduces the, the row count dramatically, right? And so any queries that are grouping by any of these attributes are going to hit the cache and it can, can be super fast, right? And then to set up this mapping, I can come to the ag table and I can say manage aggregations. And then here is where the group buys, like with the distinct count, the group buys are absolutely mandatory here. Why? Because there is no relationship in the whole model. Got right? it. So I have to replicate all of the dimension attributes and I have to set up the group buy for every single one of the dimension attributes. Right? And then down here I can set my aggregation functions, sum and count table rows. This is where we get the, 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 count, of, the count rows function returning a trillion in the trillion row demo yep. is based yep. off this mapping right here. And that's it, we're done. Uh, that, th that's all there is to it. So there's no relationship though. And there's no relationship and it doesn't even need it because it, can, it will count on these group buys instead. Okay.
Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's pretty slick. Yeah, that's pretty slick, right? All right. So it works for either of the, the modeling scenarios. And actually, you can have hybrid scenarios as well. Like, you know, if you've got a denormalized dimension table, like maybe your date dimension table, and you've got an aggregation table that's up at the month level, you don't want to have to uh, normalize out your date dimension table to be into two tables, one at the month grain, one at the day grain, so that you can create that relationship. You can just replicate month, quarter, and year in the aggregation table, set up these group by mappings for month, quarter, and year, and rely on relationships for everything else. Right. Right? So it, it, it's pretty flexible, and yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what people come up with yeah, as part of this. Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the last thing I might quickly mention, Adam, is this precedence field. You can actually have, so if I go to this layout, I've actually got another aggregation table. This one is import, so you can have, and this one is going to be considered first. They're both aggregations on the driver activity table. This one will be considered first because of the precedence. It's a higher precedence than this one, right? Got it. So what this allows so, you to so do. So as the number is yeah. larger, that means it'll hit yes. first. It will. It will hit. It will be considered first. Okay. So if I have a query that aggregates by any of these columns, it will hit this aggregation. If I then drop in one of the columns that is not in this table but is in this one, it will hit this aggregation. Interesting. And if I then drop in longitude, longitude, and latitude, it will then go to the the the, the, the big data table. source, yep. right? So this allows for these kind of balanced architectures where I could have. This table be an in-memory cache that's going to serve my executive dashboard. This one here could be optimizing my data warehouse using column store indexes. And then this one provides a drill through all the way through to the IoT data from the big data system. Wow. And you get this balanced architecture. This thing's a beautiful thing. Yeah, right? that's if amazing. If you think about this, you can catch a very high percentage of your business intelligence queries, because most business intelligence queries are aggregated, so you'll catch a very high percentage of them by using aggregations in memory. And then uh, uh, for the queries that don't get caught, they will get, they'll, they will get sent through to the data warehouse or to the big data system. Those are more targeted, less aggregated ones, which tend to be queries that they can deal with, those systems can deal with better. Right. right? So you end up with a much more balanced architecture and you utilize the resources much more efficiently and it's a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. Yeah. Oh. Oh man, all right. All right guys, I know that was a lot of information thrown at you. Hopefully yeah. you found it useful. Thank you, Christian, for You're hanging out welcome. with us. You're very welcome. Let me know down below, did this make sense? You guys have questions? We can try and follow up and uh, maybe even update the documentation to clarify yeah. this a little yeah. more. All right, guys, if you like this video, be sure to give it a big thumbs up, smash it if you so desire. If it's your first time here, hit that subscribe button. And as always, from both Patrick and myself, thank you so much for watching. Keep being awesome, and we'll see you in the next video.